Hello, my name is Jeff Messier. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering in the Schulich School of Engineering, and this is Module 9, Stochastic Processes. So similar to what we did with um, when we started our discussion of random variables, I want to begin our discussion of stochastic processes by establishing a very clear um, engineering-based notion of what exactly a stochastic process is. I guess, you know, the, the quick definition for a stochastic process is um, a random waveform. Uh, however, we can understand it a little bit more deeply by going back to our understanding of a random variable. If you'll recall, we came to understand that a random variable represents um, essentially a function that maps the outcome of a random experiment or a random process to a single number. A stochastic process is very similar. We can think of a stochastic process also as a function that maps um, the outcome of our random experiment to a time domain waveform. So rather than mapping our experimental or random experiment to a number, we map it to a waveform. And so uh, when we write a stochastic process in functional form, it's a function not only of the outcome of our random experiment zeta, but it's also a function of time. And so that's how we, we write our stochastic process. And so the best way to, I mean, get a more practical understanding of this is with an example. So um, I believe when we first discussed a continuous random variable, the example I gave you guys was um, sampling the output of a noisy um, sensor, sa sampling the voltage at the output of a noisy sensor. Um, with a voltmeter, right? So in our first experiment, our random variable um, mapped the outcome of our experiment to a voltage value of 0 0.3. So we, we basically put our voltmeter on the output of our sensor and we read the number 0.3. So that was one trial of our random experiment. For the second trial, we repeated the experiment with our voltmeter, and this time we captured a volt of minus 2.4 volts. And we can keep on sort of going with this. You can think of a stochastic process as being generated by essentially the same experiment, but rather than sampling the output of our noisy um, sensor with a voltmeter, we instead sample with an oscilloscope. And so for the first trial of our experiment, trial zero, we sample the output of our noisy sensor with an oscilloscope, and this is what we get. We get some you know, sort of time domain waveform representing the, um, the voltage at the output of the, of the sensor. We repeat the experiment, and then we get a second time domain waveform that's different than the first because of the random noise present in the, in the voltage. One thing I, I should talk about um, at this point is how we define time zero in uh, stochastic process. So you'll notice that I've kind of, you know, in our, for the two realizations of our random waveform, I've drawn them as, uh, as lining up in time. Time zero is basically defined as the start of the trial of our experiment. Now, of course, you know, we live in a causal universe, so everything happens, you know, sequentially. So, of course, the experiment that I used to generate our first realization was done before the experiment used to generate the second realization. However, um, we just kind of line things up so they, they line up in time. So we just define um, time zero as the start of our experiment, and as a result, all of our realizations can kind of line up um, and they look like they're starting at the uh, at the same point in time. This is going to be very important um, when we talk about something called the ensemble of our of our random waveform. So now, um, just to to provide you with a, a little bit of of terminology, the uh, when we talk about the ensemble 
of a stochastic process or the ensemble of a random waveform, we're talking about all possible time functions that might result from the random experiment. And so what I've drawn here are several time domain waveforms all lined up so that their time zero is sort of on top of, of the other. Um, and if, you know, I draw all possible waveforms that could result from a, a particular random experiment, that whole collection of waveforms is what's known as the ensemble. Sometimes when I think about a, a, a random process or a stochastic process, I think of the ensemble as being, you know, a big bag or a sack filled with random waveforms. And every time we perform the experiment, I reach into the bag and I pull out um, a different random waveform. So that's, that's basically the definition of, definition of the ensemble. Now, if we consider just a single waveform from the ensemble, we call that waveform the sample function, or sometimes I'll, I'll call it the realization of the, uh, a sample function or a realization of the, of the stochastic process. And so that term ref refers to just a particular waveform one particular waveform out of the ensemble. Now, there's a very interesting um, relationship between stochastic processes and random variables. And this relationship is actually super important to understand because you can't really appreciate um, stochastic process distributions if you, if you don't sort of grasp this next concept. So let's take a look at um, a particular time in our ensemble. And so let's maybe call this value, um, time value t naught. And let's take a vertical cut through our ensemble at this particular time. So if we fix our time variable, that means that our, we'll be looking at a single value in our first sample function, a single value in our second sample function, you know, a single value in our nth sample function and so on. So basically, if we fix our time um, variable, then every time we perform a different experiment, we just get a number rather than a waveform, right? Because we're only looking at the waveform at a particular time. So for experiment one, this is the, the number that we get. For experiment two, this is the number. And for experiment n, that's the number. So if you perform an, a random experiment and each time you get a different number, that's basically a random variable. And so what I'm trying to, um, the, the concept that I'm trying to get across here is that if you fix the time value in a stochastic process, then basically you're back to all you get, all you get is a random variable or that that's equivalent to a random variable. And so any, vertical cut through a stochastic process ensemble at a fixed time essentially gives you a random variable. Now, it's important to understand that, you know, the random variable that we got from our vertical cut at time t naught might have different statistics than the vertical cut at time t1, and we'll, and we'll talk about that. But if you, again, if you fix the, fix the, the time in your uh, stochastic process ensemble, you get a, a random variable. And of course, if you fix the time and you fix your experiment, then you're just left with a, with a single number. Now you'll recall from our um, random variable discussion that very quickly, uh, or very early on in that discussion, we dropped sort of the functional notation for the random variables. So uh, when I introduced the random variable, we wrote a random variable as a function of the experimental outcome zeta, but very quickly we just abandoned that and just wrote it as a single capital letter. Uh, we do something similar for a stochastic process. So for a stochastic process, we, we drop the dependence on the experimental outcome, but I still do um, continue to use the notation that indicates that it's a function of time. So our, the notation that we'll be using for stochastic processes in this course will be a capital letter um, that's a function of time. So xt is our, our stochastic process. Now, 
I said in the, the previous slide that if we fix our stochastic process and we, in time, if we look at it at just one time point, um, it's basically equivalent to a random variable. And so if that's true, then we can use all of our tools that we developed for random variables to help us understand stochastic processes. So if we fix um, our time variable at some time t1, we get essentially a random variable uh, equal to the stochastic process at time t1, and that random variable has a CDF and a PDF. And so the CDF, which we will um, use the notation uh, capital F, is just equal to the probability that our stochastic process at a particular time t is less than or equal to the argument of the CDF. So the CDF notation is similar um, to the notation we use for just random variables, except it's going to be a function now not only of lowercase x, but also time. So we maintain the, uh, um, the time argument for our CDFs and our PDFs. Sometimes I will include, you know, the subscript that um, has the uppercase X or the uppercase case Y. Uh, sometimes I won't with stochastic processes just because it can, uh, um, the notation can get a little bit messy. So that's um, the, the CDF. The PDF then is just the derivative of the, of the CDF. And we call these, um, the PDF and CDF I'm showing you on this slide are known as the first order PDF and CDF. And they're called first order because we're sampling the stochastic process at only a single point in time. As we're going to see, um, we will often sample the uh, stochastic process at two points in time, and that gives us the, uh, the second order distribution, which is what I'm going to be talking about in the next slide. So continuing with that, um, if we do sample our stochastic process at two points in time, t1 and t2, we um, get two random variables, x at t1 and x at t2. And these two random variables will have their own you know, first order PDFs. And those PDFs may or may not be the same. So um, because we're now dealing with, with two random variables, we can use uh, a joint distribution to quantify the relationship, um, the statistical relationship between them. And so, um, you know, sampling a stochastic process at two points in time results in two random variables, and we can characterize the relationship between them using the jo their joint PDF and CDF. And this is what's known as the second order distribution of the stochastic process. And so the definitions for these joint PDFs and CDFs are exactly the same as um, the definitions when we were working with regular random variables. The notation is just a little bit different. So here's our, our, uh, our joint CDF. We now have two arguments, x1 and x2, just like we had when we were working with random variables. However, we also maintain the arguments, the time arguments, t1 and t2. Um, I didn't bother showing the subscript here. And this is just equal to the probability that the stochastic process at time t1 is less than or equal to um, x1 and, that should be an and, uh, the stochastic process sampled at time t2 is less than or equal to x2. And the second order PDF is just the derivative of the CDF with respect to x1 and x2. Um, now one particularly useful way of expressing stochastic processes, uh, particularly useful if, if we want to sort of use mathematical tools to analyze them, is as uh, functions of a random variable. And so Let's uh, take an example here. So let's define a stochastic process x of t as being equal to the familiar cosine function, which is a function of time t, and where the phase phi is random. So phi is uniformly distributed between minus pi and pi. And so 
the way to kind of understand what the stochastic process is like is to imagine its ensemble. And what I've, I've tried to draw that here. So the ensemble of this stochastic process cons consists of a series of cosines, all with the same frequency omega naught, but with different random phases. So again, thinking back to this notation or this, this, this idea of um, a stochastic process as mapping the result of a random experiment to a waveform, um, each time we perform a random experiment, the cosine itself is exactly the same, but its phase changes a little bit. So we perform the random experiment, I reach into my bag of waveforms, I pull one out, and it's a cosine with a particular phase. So the sample function or a realization from our first experiment maybe looks like this. Then when I perform the experiment again, the waveform is exactly the same, it's exactly the same cosine, except the phase changes. And so we have the same cosine, same frequency, same amplitude, except it doesn't quite line up with the first one because um, its phase is different. So the peak here doesn't line up with the peak here, for example. And again, um, you know, the third realization of the stochastic process would have a, another phase, uh, a, a different phase as well. And so now um, we can see what the, what the ensemble looks like. And the reason, again, why we, we like, if possible, to describe our stochastic process as a function of a random variable um, is because, as we're going to see, you know, as we get into stochastic processes a little bit more, is that it really lends itself um, to analysis. So it's interesting here because the, the actual sort of t variation with time is a deterministic relationship. So the variation with time that we see is, is because of the cosine function. And um, it's just sort of the phase that is, uh, that is random. Here's the second example. So in the second example, we have a damped exponential. So our stochastic process x is a decaying exponential as a function of time. And the, um, the decay factor y is a random variable uniformly distributed between 0 and some value b. And our, our stochastic process in this case is de defined only for, uh, for positive time. And so when we perform our first experiment, this is our, our first sample function or our first realization. And we have a particular um, decay factor in our stochastic uh, process. When we perform the experiment again, um, y happens to be a slightly smaller number. And so our decay is not as rapid. Um, then if we perform the experiment again, we get y being a much larger number and its decay is, is really quite rapid and so on. So every time we perform our experiment, we get you know exactly the same type of waveform. There are always um, decaying exponentials. It's just the rate of decay is the, uh, is the random component. However, this is still you know, certainly a legitimate stochastic process. So for example, if we um, took a vertical slice of our ensemble and we sampled our stochastic process at a, that particular time point, each of these time points for each of our, our sample functions would be different. And so this would be, um, you know, if this was time t1, x at time t1 would vary randomly. Um, from one experiment to the next, and it does meet the requirements um, that we have for, uh, for being a random variable. And so as an illustration of why um, this stochastic process as a function of a random variable is a, is a powerful concept, um, in this last slide, what I'm going to do is I'm going to derive the first order PDF for the uh, randomly decaying exponential that we had on the on the previous slide and to do this I'm going to go straight back and it's going to be a an absolutely basically unmodified application of our uh, function of a random variable techniques 
um, that we studied a few modules ago. And so when I apply the function of random variable techniques, I actually drop the functional notation or, or the, the dependence of x on the variable t. So I just consider this a regular random variable x. Um, t is still in our equation, but it's a constant. Oh, and there should actually be a, a negative sign in there too. Um, I just treat t as a constant and um, essentially it's, it's, it's no different than any other constant in our expression. So our random variable x is a function of um, the, or is equal to the exponential function where y is an argument. And then in the following I just use the um, our standard method for figuring out the PDF of the function of a random variable. So um, lowercase x is equal to um, a function of y, which is equal e to the minus yt. So the derivative um, of g of y is given by this, um, which has just one solution. Then um, the derivative as a function of that solution is given by minus tx. We have to be a little bit careful about the limits of um, our, uh, our PDF. And so the limits of the, uh, the PDF of y are 0 and b, because y is um, uniformly distributed between 0 and b. That means that x is, is going to be distributed between e to the minus bt and e to the minus 0t, which is, of course, equal to 1. And so if we use our PDF of a function of a random variable expression, and we put it together with our bounds, this is the, um, this is the expression that we get. Now I want to be very clear what this PDF um, represents. Remember, um, if we draw our ensemble, you know, it looks something like this. You know, we have a decaying exponential, then maybe a very quickly decaying exponential. Oops, I guess maybe that wasn't so quick. And then, you know, another exponential. If we cut across the ensemble at a particular point in time and sample our stochastic process, we get a random variable, x, at a particular time t. The PDF of this random variable is given by this expression. So this is the first order PDF of our stochastic process. So the first moment of a stochastic process I want to talk about is its first order moment, which is basically just equal to the mean. Um, now the mean is going to be slightly different than the mean that we understand for a random variable. So um, whenever we take the mean of a random variable, it's always constant. Um, however, the mean of a stochastic process is going to be a function of time. And so the mathematical definition of mean is sometimes we, we write it as mu of t. Mu is a function of time. It's equal to, as you'd expect, the expected value of the stochastic process x of t, which is equal to um, just our standard um, first moment um, equation where we, we integrate with respect to x the PDF um, multiplied by um, our variable of integration. And so what we're doing here, just to kind of step back from the equation for a second, um, you know, on this slide again, I, I've drawn a picture of our ensemble. Now, if we sample our waveform at some time t1, you know, we, we get a random variable x of t1. And so the value of our mean at time t1 is just equal to the value of our random variable at this particular time. If we sample at time t2, then the value of our mean is going to be 
the expected value of the stochastic process at time t2. These expected values might not be the same, and so that's why mean is a function of time. So the mean can change depending on where we sample in our um, where we sample in our random uh, or along our time axis. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. I want also to at this point to to make um, another really important point, and that's has to do with this uh, with this integral. You notice that we're integrating um, with respect to x, and so sometimes um, students, when uh, when you're first exposed to a stochastic process, assume that we are averaging the stochastic process along the time axis. So, um, and, and that's a, a logical thing to, to think, right? Because, um, you know, we've got some time domain waveform, let's figure out its average by just averaging with respect to time. However, that is not how the mean is determined. You can really think of this stochastic, or you can really think of this integration as being performed across the ensemble rather than across rather than along the time axis so basically we take a particular value for time and let's say we fix this value t at time t1 that means that this pdf is going to represent the distribution of our random variable at some time t1 and then we're going to just do our standard um, um, center of mass integration to uh, to determine the mean using that particular distribution for that particular point in time. So think of it as averaging across the ensemble, or in other words, basically averaging this point, this point, and this point, um, or this point, this point, and this point. So later on, we are going to look at a special class of stochastic processes called um, ergodic stochastic processes that do allow us to average along the time axis, but there's certain very specific conditions that we must meet um, before this is allowed. So there are a couple of methods for determining mean. Um, the first one is to use the first order PDF or the equation for the first order PDF and uh, perform the integral that I gave you guys on, on the previous slide. And we can do this using, uh, or for the damped exponential. So if you'll recall from the previous module, we determined the um, first order PDF of the damped exponential stochastic process using um, functions function of a random variable techniques. And so all I do is I just integrate um, that PDF with respect to x. So I integrate um, over the values where the PDF is defined. This is the equation for the, the PDF itself. Perform the integral and then this is our expression for mean. And if you were to plot the expression for mean, it ends up basically looking like a decaying exponential. So it looks something like that. So it looks kind of like the waveforms in our ensemble, but I want to really stress that the mean, so the time domain um, function for mean, is not random. It's a deterministic function, um, as all moments are. And so, and even this, but the form for mean, you know, this the fact that it is a decaying exponential um, should kind of make sense because when we think back to our ensemble, and again I'll, I'll try to draw it again just very quickly here, you know we have a slowly decaying exponential, um, then we have a quickly decaying exponential, oops, and then maybe we have kind of a medium one. So if we sample our waveform at a, a small value of time, so if we sample it very early on, um, even though our exponentials all decay at a different rate, you know, all of our sample functions decay at a different rate, you know, on average, they have 
larger values at smaller values of time. Um, if we sample them later on, you know, some of them are bigger than others, but they all decrease. Um, they're all, on average, smaller than they were at, at lower values of time. So we would expect our mean to decay um, as, the, as the value of time increases. So sometimes um, it's not straightforward to derive the, the actual um, first order PDF. Uh, but fortunately, there is, you know, again, using functions of a random variable um, concept, there is a shortcut for determining the mean of a stochastic process. So if we think of the mean of a stochastic process as being the expected value of x, it's the expected value of e to the minus yt. And if we just think of this, again, as a, as a function of a random variable, so g of y is equal to e to the minus lowercase yt, then um, we can just use the PDF for y, which is just the uniformly distributed PDF, um, uniformly distributed between 0 and b, so those define the limits of our integration, and then we multiply the PDF um, for y by the function of the, uh, of the PDF, just like we did way back um, for our, our basic random variables. And so um, when we do that, the integral shapes up like this, perform the integration, and we get exactly the same expression that we got um, when we used the actual first order PDF in the previous slide. Again, this is very handy because if you um, just want to determine the mean, then this saves you from having to derive the actual PDF, which um, isn't always so easy. We can do a second example using this same um, method to determine the mean of the random cosine waveform. So again, the expected value of x of t is equal to the expected value of a function of the random variable phi. We set up the integral exactly like we did on the previous slide. So our PDF is uniformly distributed between minus pi to pi. Um, this is the value of our PDF. This is our function, and we're integrating with respect to phi. However, if we integrate um, from minus pi to pi in our cosine wave, um, then we just get zero. So the mean of our, um, our random cosine wave is, is actually zero. This also makes intuitive sense, I think, because you know we have a, a random, or we have a, our cosine wave, and then we have a cosine wave that's been shifted, and then we have another cosine wave um, that's been shifted again. And so if we sample at a particular value in time, Sometimes we're below, sometimes we're above, but it should um, basically average out to zero. And the waveform basically doesn't change. So if we sample you know, at, at a later time, again, we have essentially exactly the same kind of cosine wave, you know, sometimes above, sometimes below. So not only does it make, I think, intuitive sense that our mean is zero, it also kind of makes intuitive sense that the mean should not change um, depending on where we sample our stochastic process. So, the, and this is important to keep in mind, sometimes the mean doesn't always have to be a function of time, sometimes it's a constant, um, and sometimes that constant is zero. So, um, mean I think is a, is a relatively familiar concept. We, um, we had mean obviously when we were working with random variables. Now I want to move on to talking about the second order moments of a stochastic process. And uh, we're going to talk about something called the autocorrelation function of a stochastic process. So in this class, I'm going to denote the autocorrelation function using a capital R. It's a function of two time values, t1, t2. And it's equal to the expected value of the random variable that we get when we sample the stochastic process at time t1 multiplied by the random variable that we get when we 
the when we sample the stochastic process at time t2. So it's basically just covariance, right? If we think of these just as two as two random variables, um, that's defined in general by this you know somewhat daunting looking integral now because we've got a lot of variables, but it's just the double integral um, with respect to x1 and x2. Um, our second order PDF will also be a function of time. <coughs> Excuse me, our time values t1 and t2, but um, those are not involved in the integral at all, so they're just treated as constants. Um, note that the autocorrelation function is a deterministic function, um, so it's not a, a random function like our stochastic, uh, our stochastic waveform is. Uh, and basically the purpose of the autocorrelation is to measure the similarity between two samples of a stochastic process. So if we have an ensemble, you know, this is maybe one sample function, this is another one, you know, this is another one, something like that. And if we sample this stochastic process at two time points, autocorrelation just tells us how statistically similar the waveform is at these two particular points. The reason why this is going to be very valuable for us later on is because the autocorrelation function can be thought of as giving us some measure or some picture as to how quickly the signal is changing or the, or the rate of change of the, of the signal. And we're then going to basically kind of take this idea or concept and tie it into the concept of power spectral density, which is what a stochastic process um, looks like in the, in the frequency domain. Okay, and just to um, talk about this notion of rate of change a, a little bit further, let's um, consider two different stochastic processes. And so um, the first stochastic process is above the red line. And on the left here, I show a single realization of our stochastic process, a single sample function. And let's say we sample the waveform at two points in time. And the separation between those two points in time um, is tau. So because this waveform is changing quite slowly, this sample and this sample are not that different from each other. And if I showed a whole bunch of other sample functions from this um, same stochastic process, uh, let's assume that they're all similarly um, slowly kind of varying waveforms. And so regardless of which sample function we choose, there's going to be some similarity between these two points in time. So the random variables that we get uh, by sampling at these two points in time are going to be statistically similar. And so if we look at our value, um, and then on the right hand side here we have the autocorrelation function. And so the maximum point we get is when we have the maximum similarity when we're basically comparing a, a sample with itself. So if we sample the waveform at time t1 and then we compare it with the waveform sampled at time t1, uh, those two random variables are identical. And so for a time separation tau of 0, we get the maximum point on our autocorrelation function. And then as we increase our time separation, um, the autocorrelation function decreases, which means there's starting to be some difference between our two random variables, but there's still, you know, a fair bit of statistical similarity. So for our value, um, you know, for the value of tau I, I drew over here on the left, you know, we have still a fairly high autocorrelation value. This is a little bit different for the waveform um, that we have on the bottom of the slide. So let's say, um, you know, in the second example, this is the sample function for a very quickly varying waveform. And let's say we sample this waveform at the same time separation that we did the waveform at the top of the slide. And you know these are the, the two time points that we get. And our time separation still is tau. Now, because this waveform is changing so quickly, it's gone through several sort of random fluctuations. Um, over the, the time period tau. And because of that, 
these two samples, if we looked at a number of realizations of our of this stochastic process, these two samples would really have no statistical similarity at all. Uh, sometimes one would be positive, sometimes one would be negative, sometimes they would be close, sometimes they would be far away. Because the, the waveform is changing so quickly, um, there's no relationship between these samples. And if we look over here on the right now at our autocorrelation function, again, the autocorrelation function is, always has a maximum at zero because if you, dec if you compare um, a random variable to itself, you know, it's always identical. However, because this waveform is changing so quickly, you don't have to have a very large amount of separation before the autocorrelation value or autocorrelation function basically goes to zero. And when it's equal to zero, it means that there's no statistical similarity between those um, random variables at all, or in other words, they are they're uncorrelated. And so the autocorrelation function drops to zero because the waveform is changing so quickly. So we can see then, <clears throat> if we step back and we take a look at these two autocorrelation functions, that um, you know, uh, for the for the top stochastic process, if we have a slowly changing random waveform, we tend to get a nice slowly changing autocorrelation function. If we have a very sharp, jagged random waveform quickly changing, we have a very sharp, quickly changing with autocorrelation function, and so that relationship between the shape of the autocorrelation function and the actual sort of time domain variation of the random waveform itself is going to be very important as we're going to see later when we um, when we talk about power spectral density but for now just kind of keep this idea that um, you know a nice slow stochastic process has a nice gradual autocorrelation function while a quick stochastic process has a, has a very sharp autocorrelation function. Okay, so let's proceed to an example where we actually determine the autocorrelation function. Um, in this case, we're determining the autocorrelation for the random cosine that we've been working with. So autocorrelation is just equal to the expected value of our stochastic process at time t1 multiplied by the same process at time t2. And so since we're working with functions of a random variable for this particular example, we just plug in the expressions for our stochastic process. Um, identical expressions, but for different times, t1 and t2. Then um, we've got a product of two cosines, so just using uh, trig identities, we get uh, two expressions for the cosine. Now, you'll notice in this first expression, the random uh, variable phi has dropped out because we've taken the difference of the arguments of the cosines. Um, over here, of course, it hasn't because we've, uh, we've taken the summation. But this is um, one point where I'm going to you know, show you a, a useful trick when you're doing uh, derivations that involve expected value. We're taking the expected value of this entire term. Um, however, because it's a linear operation um, and we've got an addition here, we can just take the expected value of the first term and add it to the expected value of the second term, um, which is what we do in the next line of the equation. However, this first expression doesn't have any random component to it. The random variable dropped out. It, it, it was canceled out. And so the expected value of a deterministic equation is just that deterministic equation. We then, we do, however, in our second term, have to take the expected value of our cosine um, with the random variable in it. To do that, we um, sort of drop down to the bottom of the slide here and use our functions of a function of a random variable trick for determining expected value. The integral of this cosine multiplied by the, the PDF for the random phase change is just performed from minus pi to pi. Um, when you integrate this cosine from minus pi to pi, you get zero. So this second term just goes to zero. The expected value of this first term is just equal to the first term because it's deterministic. And so this is the final expression for our autocorrelation function. Now, something I, I really want to stress about these autocorrelation functions is that they are 
three-dimensional functions. They're surfaces, right? Because we have uh, a function that takes two arguments. So if we were to plot the function, this is what we would get. We get this, um, so here's our time axis t1, um, yeah, and our, our time, sorry, our time axis t2, our time axis t1, and this is, you know, the value of the autocorrelation function on the z-axis. And uh, so we can see it's a surface, but we can see it sort of retains the oscillatory, the, uh, the oscillatory nature of the, that is a word, um, the nature of our stochastic process. So we had, um, you know, a, a random waveform that was basically just consisted of an ensemble that was just a bunch of sort of oscillating cosines and we have preserved that same oscillation in our autocorrelation function. So if we want to think of an autocorrelation function as capturing the rate of change or the time domain variation of a stochastic process, clearly that's the case, right? Because we had cosines in our ensemble and we basically got kind of a cosine um, type surface thing here um, for, the, for the autocorrelation function. So as a second example, let's use basically the same method to determine the autocorrelation function for our damped exponential. So we start out with um, the same expression. We then put in our function of a random variable um, expressions for the stochastic process with the two time arguments, t1 and t2. We then um, simplify it. So it's the function of a single um, exponential with some time value t1 and t2. However, if we look at this, this is just the same as, you know, our mean expression, right? So our mean started out with the expected value of this function. However, now we've just got a different time variable that we plug in here. And so the expression for the autocorrelation, it doesn't always work out this way, but for this particular case, the expression for the autocorrelation for our damped exponential is the same as the expression for the mean of this particular stochastic process, but we have the summation of our two time values um, in for, uh, put, put in for our, our, our time argument. This is a plot of the decaying exponential autocorrelation function, and as you can see, it is also essentially kind of a decaying, a surface that's, that's essentially a decaying exponential. So again, we see an example of, you know, a random process that consisted of an ensemble of decaying exponential type waveforms having an autocorrelation function that essentially preserves that fundamental shape that, uh, that we saw in the, in the random waveforms in the, in the ensemble. And now just a, a couple of kind of additional definitions or variations on the idea of autocorrelation function. Um, autocovariance is just equal to the autocorrelation function minus the product of the means of the um, stochastic process defined at time t1 and t2. So um, for our previous examples, it's uh, easy for us to come up with an expression for autocovariance because um, we also had we're able to derive expressions for the means of our two example waveforms. Correlation coefficient um, is equal to autocovariance multiplied by the or sorry normalized by the standard deviation of the stochastic process at our sample times. This normalization basically ensures that the maximum value of the correlation coefficient is is equal to one. So it's between plus and minus one, and so that's um, Kind of a nice thing to have, but it's not uh, it's not so essential. I find personally, anyways, I, I tend to work either with autocorrelation function or autocovariance. 